Today we're at Jim and I Farms with Valerie and Jim Duver. Today you're going to learn about pollinators, honeybees specifically. We're going to talk about life cycles and how pollinators affect our world. Let's have a great field trip. I'm here with Valerie Duver and you are the owner and operator of Jim and I Farms. That's correct. But can you tell me a little bit about what your operation is all about? Sure, sure. We have a, a 20 plus acre hobby farm that, that we work and we focus on bees and pollinators. My husband Jim, who's been keeping bees for over 40 years, and I have been doing education for a little over a decade. We've been uh, providing education to the public about um, honeybees specifically, and then we've branched into pollinators. And what we've tried to do on our hobby farm is to uh, change the planting so it's not so much uh, agricultural crops. And so we've done a lot of landscaping with nectar and pollen rich plants to attract pollinators and to feed our honeybees. Um, yeah, that's basically what we're doing. I'm semi-retired. He's still working full-time with a full-time job, so we just kind of do this for fun now. <laughs> what are some of the big misconceptions that people have about honeybees? Um, they feel like that you can't have them close to your property, that they're dangerous, especially for kiddos that are allergic, and I'm allergic to bee stings. When I um, got into this, I didn't know I was allergic, so now I'm very aware of when I can and cannot get into the hives and play with them. Um, but for the most part, they don't bother us. Um, our beehives are very close to the to the fencing, and we have a one and four year old grandson that play here all the time that have never been affected. Um, bees, for the most part, are just doing their thing. They just want to go out and get some food, and raise their young, and go about their business. So they're not uh, they're not the same as a as a as some of the wasps would be, let's say, or some of the yellow jackets that actively seek out problems <laughs> yeah so so one of the the wonderful things about honeybees is that they provide us with honey and, it, and it's a delicious thing that that we get from honeybees but there's also a lot of other advantages of honeybees absolutely can yeah. you tell us a little bit about what those advantages are sure so honey is the one is the one advantage that's um, greatly promoted because it was the sweet source for centuries and then sugarcane came along and that kind of died by the wayside but honey itself has lots of uh, medicinal benefits they actually use it in burn units for uh, burns because they can't find anything that has the viscosity of honey and also the antibiotic properties even artificially made so they've been known to use honey for for stings and for abrasions um, there's all kinds of products that you can harvest from the hive, such as um, pollen, propolis, um, uh, royal jelly, which I'm not a real fan of. But additionally, honeybees are the number one pollinator for um, crops that we use, commercial crops that we as humans ingest. Um, they're not from the United States, they're not native. They were brought over uh, on the boats as folks came in from Europe and um, Asia and uh, Africa. And, and the like um, but they've come along as the settlers have come along and they've used them like I mentioned for sugar production for sweetness but also to pollinate crops um, I cannot tell you how many more cucumbers you're gonna get pickles you're gonna get if you just put one or two hives in with your your pickles you'll they'll come out your ears so and if you start beekeeping and you address the environment for honeybees you're also bringing other pollinators back you're bringing um, bumblebees back and carpenter bees and butterflies and moths and hummingbirds i mean all kinds of things um, that that help nature so you're you're bringing things back to the way they kind of should be mm -hmm. you know in my opinion yeah <laughs> All right, so the process for, for pollination for honeybees and for uh, bumblebees and such is inside a flower itself, at the very base where the green part meets the color, is, a, is an organ, or a, uh, an organ would be a good word, in the flower that contains nectar. It's called the nectary. And bees try to get down there to get to the sugar. As they're doing that, they're rubbing across the anthers of the flower, which have the male reproductive part called pollen. And they're moving that pollen to the stigma of the plant so the pollen can go down into the ovary of the flower and cause reproduction. The fruits of a flower are the seeds that will cause the plant to go through its reproductive cycle. 
So pollination is the first step in fertilization, which is the first step in creating fruit, in, in causing the plant to reproduce. So when we have an apple, it has the seeds contained to make an apple tree. Mm -hmm. But in order to get to the apple, we have to work backwards to the flower and work one step further to the bee or some kind of pollinator that will help with that process. Um, bees are considered biotic pollinators, meaning that they are not wind driven. They're not water driven. They're human driven. Um, wind and, and rain and such pollinate grasses for the most part, yeah. like corn. Right. They're good pollinators. But soybeans benefit from bees because they're not driven by wind and rain. So. <laughs> Just like we need food and water, mm -hmm. so do bees. Can you kind of walk us through what a bee is going to use for food and, and for their water source? Sure, sure. So uh, in a bee's life cycle, they need three things. They need water, pollen, and nectar. And honeybees will travel two to two and a half miles to get that which covers roughly 80,000 acres. That's a lot, that's a lot. Yeah. From where we stand as the crow flies, as they say, we would hit I-70. That's how far two, two and a half miles are. They prefer to be 500 to 1,000 feet from the home, and they will go and search flowers to get the nectar and the pollen, depending on the time of year and what they're pulling, what their needs are to raise their brood. And then water they, is the same thing. Once they identify a water source, they will continually go back. So um, if and when you set up honey beehives, you need to make sure your water source is consistent and close especially if your neighbors have a pool or you have a swimming pool because once they figure out they've got this lovely water source over here they will continue to tap it there's not a whole lot you can do to to fix that part yeah. um, in the life cycle of the honeybee um, the queen is there's only one queen in a hive and her only job is to lay eggs she doesn't clean herself she doesn't forage she doesn't um, make honey all she does is to take her antennae and she measures the size of the cell, she backs up and lays an egg. If the cell is a smaller cell, she will lay an egg that will develop into a worker, which is a female bee. Mm -hmm. If the cell is just a little bit larger, and we're talking a millimeter or two larger, she will lay a, an egg that becomes a drone, which is a male bee. In a typical hive, which we're going to consider these typical hives are either two supers, which are the smaller ones, or two brood boxes, which are the larger one. Um, there will be roughly 50 to 60,000 bees. And out of those, there'll be one queen, five to 800 drones, or the boys, and then all the rest are worker bees. The worker bees are the really cool part of the hive because their age dictates what they do. As soon as they are hatched, they turn around and they start cleaning out their cell and they go through and they clean out other cells. And they're responsible for feeding what we call bee um, bread, which is a mix of nectar and pollen, and then royal jelly, which is made from the, the hypopharyngeal gland in their head. It has the hormones that cause you to mature mm -hmm. as a bee. A little bit of that, and they call that bee bread, and they feed that to the, to the egg and to the larva. Um, these brand new bees that have just hatched take care of older larvae before they become um, pupa. And then as they get a little bit more mature, then they get to take care of the younger age. Hey. Yeah. Um, once a worker bee is about two weeks old, they are now allowed to leave the hive. Before that time, they've never been outside. They just take care of what's going on inside. They make propolis, which is the sticky stuff that you find in a hive that sticks everything together. They take the, the nectar and the pollen from the forage bees that go out and get it and the water. They will come and meet on the entrance and then they give it to their sister and their sister will take it to wherever it needs to be stored or used. But once they hit that two to three weeks age, then they start going outside. They start foraging, they start uh, cleaning out the hive, they'll take out dead body parts. They start protecting the hive. You'll actually see bees that stand in the front and they wait for somebody <laughs> to come up. And they're the ones that will come and bump you to say, you, you don't need to be here. You need to yeah. you know, go find someplace else. We're not happy that you're here. Um, and then as they get older, they start flying and collecting nectar and pollen. Um, the further they have to go, they do whatever they have to do to keep the colony going. One of the misconceptions or one of the frustrations people have when they get into beekeeping is they feel like they have to keep each and every bee alive. And that's not possible. You have to treat the colony as the livestock and not the individual bees. 
because honeybees in the summertime, except for the queen, will only live six to eight weeks. Hmm. As they go into fall, their body actually changes and they will last between 10 and 12 weeks because they have to get through the winter to take care of the little bit of brood and eggs that are in there. Um, and then when they come out of that, she starts laying eggs again, then she lays quite a few more and we start the cycle over again. So they have a little short life and then they have an extended life and then the new bees have a little short life again, it's cyclic. How long can a, a colony or a hive of bees last? It depends. <laughs> So, in order for a honeybee hive to survive, they go through a, a cycle where they swarm. Mm -hmm. That means that the old queen and half of the brood, or half of the worker bees, fill up with honey. They fill up their, their honey stomachs with honey, and they go find someplace else to live. The bees that are left behind make a new queen, and the way they do that is they take a little egg you know, as young as they can find, they extend the cell so it's a little bit longer and they start feeding her more royal jelly and less honey and uh, pollen to cause her body to mature. That process takes about two weeks. If you try to cut down on the swarming and you, you pay attention to it, perpetually you could have a hive that goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, anymore, we have a problem with a pest called a varroa mite, which is an itty bitty tiny mite that uh, feeds on the fat bodies of the honeybee. That's not problematic enough. It's like a tick about this size that's hanging yeah. onto you, right? That's sucking on your fat. Mine would live forever. <laughs> but um, they have parasites, or I'm sorry, viruses that they transmit. And I think the last article I read, it's up to like 18 different. Um, viruses that can be transmitted. So if you do nothing, if you buy a package of bees or a nuke of bees, which is a half of a hive, and you set it up and you walk away and you do nothing, it will be dead in three years because mm. the varroa mites will take it over. So you have to stay on top of it and do some, a little bit of management. You don't have to be obnoxious about it, but a little bit of management yeah. um, to make sure that they're healthy and safe. What does that management look like for someone who might have just started a, a beehive? Um, pretty much you go in and you make sure they have plenty of uh, available food. And uh, as a new beekeeper, you know when you get them in in March or April, which is usually when we get them in, there's nothing flowering. So they've got nothing to eat, right? right. So you feed them sugar water. And we do that because it's energy source it's quick it's inexpensive they can get to it very quickly and as soon as the nectar the pollen and the nectar start going to town which we're getting ready to do that here towards the end of may they they'll quit taking the sugar water and they'll start taking the the nectar they would much rather have it it's a different chemical makeup it's a different uh, thickness the whole nine yards what we forget though is that we have times in the summertime when we don't have any rain for weeks or months at a time. And that nectar in the flowers literally dries up. They can't get it out. Even if they can get down and get to it, they can't get it out, it's too thick. And so we have to go back and, and uh, revisit it and add more sugar water to them to make sure that they have plenty of food, that they can keep their, their colony going and keep it strong. Mm -hmm. um, what we suggest in managed beekeeping in a hive that you're keeping that you're going in and you're working with is that at least twice a year you check for varroa mites and we do that with powdered sugar we take some bees out of the nest some of the the uh, younger bees out of the nest we gather about a cup of them which is oh, roughly 300 and you put them into a jar and you put powdered sugar on it and you shut it you, you close the lid and you shake them which makes them really mad and what happens is they heat up and whatever varroa mites are in there fall off because the bees are shaking and they're getting hot and the varroa mites want nothing to do with it. And so then you take the powdered sugar and you empty it out of the jar and as you're doing that uh, the varroa mites drop down, you put it in a dish of water, a mm -hmm. white dish of water, and then you can count the varroa mites. If you have three or four you probably need to do something. If you have less than that then you're good to go till the next time. And we suggest doing that in the first part when you get your bees and then going into fall okay. as, as you are um, getting bees ready to we put them down for the winter basically. So that's how you stay on top of it. There's lots of different things that you can do to manage the bees but that's a whole other lecture series. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when when is the ideal time to try to get honey from a beehive? 
Um, again, it depends on the beekeeper and the in the in the flowers around. Mm -hmm. I know in the city, those commercial beekeepers in the city that have lots of floral sources, they can start harvesting in June and July. Yeah, and sometimes they'll get a couple of harvests. Um, if they're in a grove that has some um, locust in it, they might be able to harvest in early June, which is very rare. That's really cool, honey. Um, we used to do it twice a year. We used to do it at the end of June and then do it again in October. And we have decided to wait until October to let the bees have as much nat natural nectar as possible so they can keep care of their young. Because the idea behind beekeeping is to keep the colony perpetual and living through the winter and then we harvest excess honey. Yeah. So. So just like any animal is going to have predators, mm -hmm. bees are interesting because they have the weather is a predator. Mm -hmm. um, if it gets too cold, it can kill them. If mm -hmm. it gets too hot, they can overheat. Right. But they also have weather. Um, you know, we hear about tornadoes coming through and, mm -hmm. and knocking hives out. But then they also have animals as predators. Right. Um, I know for for our hives, um, we have coons like to get in them, mice in the winter especially. So. What is something that um, we as beekeepers can do to kind of prevent some of these predators from, from disturbing the beehives? Sure, sure. So we take precautions when we're setting our hives up. Um, you can see that we have bricks on the lids that mm -hmm. keeps the wind from popping it out. And then as the weather gets iffy, you know, if we get a bad storm that comes through, we come out and make sure that everybody's stacked back up again for the most part. For the smaller mammal type critters like skunks and um, possum and coons and nosy cats and things yeah. like that. Um, you can put carpet tack, which is the little board that goes around the room that attacks, yeah. attaches to the carpet. It's got nails in it. And you either put it in the very front of the hive where you think they may walk in the weeds or right on the landing strip where the bees are going in and out. And as they reach their paws up there, they get poked and so they don't want anything to do with it for the most part. Um, with our hives being so close to our backyard, we have a small uh, lab dog that anything that is not supposed to be here, she <laughs> comes outside and takes a look. So yeah. for the most part, we really don't have too many issues. For mice, mice are a big problem in the winter time. Yeah. They really are. Bees will um, take care of any predator that actually gets into the hive. Right. If you make sure that your opening is less than three eighths of an inch, that's the amount of space that a bee needs to move around. So most openings are three quarters of an inch, but you want to move it down to three eighths. Then usually bees can't get in, or I'm sorry, mice can't get in, in there. If a mouse does get into a hive that's a strong hive, the bees will kill it. Mm -hmm. They'll sting it to death and then they put it in a corner and then they cover it all up with propolis, which is this gummy sticky stuff that they make from tree sap and wax. Mm -hmm. And so you will find this, this mouse kind of mummified inside the hive itself but they do that because as the mouse decays those those pathogens don't come into the hive it's completely encased and away from the rest of the nest so yeah usually if you have mice issues you have to lower your entrance and make sure your hive is very strong mm -hmm. those are the two the two big deals such interesting creatures. i know <laughs> So we are dressed in um, what I call a, a bee suit. <laughs> yeah. And what this does is it just kind of protects um, bees from stinging through or mm -hmm. what I've noticed when I'm in my getting in my beehive is they might sting through, but the stinger won't get quite into the skin. Correct. Um, so I'm gonna put my hood up. Can, can you kind of just walk us through um, the, the bee suit as a whole? Sure, sure. So the bee suit is to protect the beekeeper, obviously. Um, these come in handy for all kinds of things though. I mean, if you have a hornet's nest you need to get rid of, a bee suit sure comes in handy. You don't have to have a full suit like we have here. Mine is three layers of mesh, so it's a little bit, um, it has more air movement. It's not really lightweight by any means. And mine is super extra large because we have lots of people come out and want to to follow Jim, my husband, around to, to do the beekeeping. Um, so we have an extra big suit for them yeah. to use. So you can see I kind of built up. But the idea behind it is you have everything that's skin covered up from the top of your head to your toes. You can do that with just a veil. Right? Which is just this. this. This part, right. And then have maybe two a turtleneck or two layers of shirt on, a couple layers of pants on, maybe one layer of pants, and then boots or thick 
uh, shoes, not mesh shoes, right. and, and socks. Not flip-flops. Right. We actually transmit hormones that we don't know, pheromones that we don't know that we transmit, but bees do because they communicate with pheromones. Um, the, the queen gives out pheromones, the drones do, the workers do, and that's how they communicate. Because they can't talk. They can't say, hey, we're out of honey. We gotta go. They <laughs> communicate with pheromones. So as we come up there, they pick up our pheromones and they know it's not supposed to be in that hive area. Um, as a recommendation, I always tell folks get the get the most protection that you can to start with, and then as you feel more comfortable around the bees, then you can start losing some of it. Um, my husband, like I mentioned, Jim's been doing it for 40 years, and he basically has a jacket or a veil and doesn't use gloves. Where I, on the other hand, suit up like I'm hazmat. So I, I have some nitro gloves that I will put on um, that are very sweaty, but they are excellent as far as bee stings because bees cannot get through. Mm. And like you mentioned, they might be able to land and try to sting, but there's not enough depth for that stinger to make to make a connection. The thing you need to be concerned about with bees, with honeybees, is they can sting one time, but they have a barbed stinger. So once they get in there and they sting and they fly away, it actually breaks their, breaks their abdomen apart. And there's an organ attached with it that continues to pump venom into your, into the area that you stung, that mm -hmm. they stung. It also sends out a pheromone to the other sisters to say, you need to come, we got a predator, we got, we need some help. And they will come to that area where you got stung. So you may get multiple stings there and it's just like this. It's very quick. You got to get that stinger out as quickly as possible with your fingernail or a credit card or a hive tool, let me get it out. So uh, I would suggest protecting your hands and especially your face. They come to your breath. You, hmm. you know, dispense carbon dioxide, they're going to come to your breath. Um, so you want to make sure that that is at least covered up. And then as you're working a hive, you want to work the hive from the back side. This is the front side where the bees are coming and going. What you don't want to do is to get into their flight path. So as they're coming out of the hive, um, you'll be able to see them take off and that's the level that they're going to fly. They're going to fly across that field, that same level, to whatever nectar source they're going to. They've had scout bees that came back to say, hey, we found this great clover and it's ready to be harvested. And they do a waggle dance inside to tell them where it is. <laughs> and so a bunch of, of the worker bees will go out and, and get that nectar and pollen and bring it back into the hive. If you have an area that you're concerned about people walking through this path, you know, like this is in a sidewalk area, let's say, or in the backyard and there's a neighbor behind there. If you put a barrier of some sort in front of it, then the bees will go up and over the barrier and so they'll be above their heads and so if you put an eight foot fence there or a big tree or shrub there they'll go up and over and people won't even know that they're there unless they're looking for them they won't even they won't even know i know a lot of kids love the bee movie and one of the the scenes in the bee movie is you see the the smokers going uh, can you kind of explain why beekeepers would use um, a smoker? Sure, sure. So what a smoke does inside the hive is it di um, disperses the pheromones that are going on. Inside the hive itself, they want it to be as dark as possible. Mm -hmm. And anytime you move the lid or you move the frame a little bit and there's a crack of light, the bees get excited that there's somebody breaking in. It would be the equivalent of us hearing the door crack. Yeah. You know, or the knob turn and you're like, all right, who's coming into my house? I'm not happy. Yeah. <laughs> so what the smoke does is it calms down those pheromones inside the hive. It also, um, human nature is such that when smoke is introduced, <clears throat> we go lower. We drop mm -hmm. down and get away from it. Forest fires, building fires and such were taught to do. Bees intuitively do that. You smoke them, they drop down a little bit lower. So you can get in and do your thing without having a bunch of bees bother you. Um, but you don't want to over smoke them because you will kill them, you know. Yeah. Some folks that have lung issues have gone to sugar water. They've gone to a nice mix, mix of sugar water. So they spritz their bees with sugar water, which again drop, causes them to drop down lower. But then they spend a bunch of time cleaning each other because they got the sugar water all over them, right? Which is yeah. not a bad thing. Right. It helps with the varroa population, gives them something to do, gets them to eat. But it also gets them out of the way so you can get in, get what you need to do, and get out. What are we going to see when we open these boxes? Okay, so these these particular boxes are, are representative of bees that we purchased this year. They're, they're brand new bees. They came in a package, which there were about 10,000 bees in them, and we set their homes up and introduced them, I want to say the middle of April, okay? 
The first box has a feeder in it. It has sugar water in it and we have it covered so it protects it from the sun and the rain and such. So when we open the lid, you're going to see a feeder inside. We're going to remove that and you'll see a little strip above the, the, uh, the unpainted box or the cedar box there. That's called the inner cover. And we put that on there so you can get stuff out because bees stick everything together. It's really hard to get things apart. So we can pry that open and get inside the frame itself. Once you pop open the frame, you're going to see bees all across the top of the frames. Hopefully on all 10 frames. The frame is like a card that's inside and in the center of it is a rectangle of wax. And inside the wax are little cells, they're hexagon shaped cells. And that's what the bees use to lay their eggs, raise their brood, uh, store the honey and the nectar and the pollen in the bee bread. Mm -hmm. It's kind of their pantry of sorts, except they have a nursery there too. Um, so we will take a look at some of the frames and see what's going on. Um, we usually start on the outer edges because there's fewer the bees like to stay in the center and then they grow like a beach ball does. They get, you know, bigger as the summer goes and then when they get down to the winter and fall they start shrinking it down again to the center where they're about the size of a softball. So we'll start at the ends and move the frames out of the way take the frame and look at it to see if we have any indications that the queen is doing her job. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that we see all four stages of the uh, metamorphic cycle, which are eggs, larva, pupa, and adult bees. We make sure that we see those. If we see those indications and they seem to look healthy, we need to get out of the hive. There's nothing else that we need to do at this point in time because we just want to make sure the queen is happy. If we don't see those indications on the first couple of frames on the outside, we'll go in a little bit further and take a look. And if we don't see anything there, we may go to the bottom box because bees, for the most part, move from the bottom up. So since these bees are less than a month inside of our hive or their new home, they may not have had time to expand as they needed to expand for whatever reason. For the most part, we've had rainy, rainy weather around here and bees can't fly in the rain because they breathe through their bodies and um, so when it rains it suffocates them mm -hmm. so they can't get out and get nectar and pollen and, and so it may be that they're just trying to live off the sugar water and survive without thriving and we want to look for evidence of thriving bees. So around your, your house here you have beautiful flowers, you have um, wonderful raised bed gardens and they're all for the purpose of one having beautiful things to look at but two sure for bee habitat. Uh, can you kind of walk us through why you choose the plants that you chose and how other people can maybe um, build great bee habitat? Sure, sure. So my husband and I both have degrees in horticulture and we've been doing landscaping for 40 plus years. And um, as we got into beekeeper, we noticed that you could alter your landscape just a little bit by thoughtfully selecting your plants it still makes for a beautiful landscape. You can have it even set up so it's lower maintenance, but it's beneficial to not only you as, a, as an aesthetic value, but for the bees. There's yeah. nectar and pollen sources. And so as we select plants, my first indication anymore is to say, will the bees or the butterflies or the hummingbirds benefit from this? And if not, then I pick something else because there's, there's so many species. Um, one of the talks I, that I have done in the past is on planting, thoughtful planting for bees. And there's over 50,000 species that you can select from. The majority of them are in the daisy family. And you will see that as we um, kind of tour around a little bit to see what we have. Um, so there's really no reason to not plant for bees and butterflies, yeah. honestly. So the big difference between planting for bees and butterflies, I do want to point out, is that bees, uh, the proboscis, proboscis or tongue is about a half an inch long, where a butterfly's is about three quarters of an inch. So the flower itself, so oh. these are both flowers that bees will hit. And you can see that they're multiple, they have multiple petals. This dandelion, has multiple flowers. Each one of these has a nectar source and so they'll hit it a number of different areas. So the idea behind selecting flowers in the daisy family is they're all, for the most part, they're composite flowers so there's lots of nectar sources in a little small package. 
where something like a clematis or a trumpet vine has one nectar source and usually the throat of the flower which is the depth from the outside down to the nectary is a lot longer and so the bees can't get down in there sometimes they have to go through the side to get to it so.